a wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for the task. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Now, I imagine some of you knew right off that I was reading from the book of Proverbs. Others of you may have thought this is some kind of poetry, and others still may have thought, sure, it's poetic in nature, but I thought for sure that was a biography about Ruth. Well, the fun thing is, there's potential that you're all correct. If you remember in the very first session, I told you that in the Hebrew scriptures, Ruth is actually placed right after the book of Proverbs. Now, some scholars think that Ruth is after Proverbs 31 to serve as an example of this virtuous woman. But other scholars think Ruth is placed here because she is that virtuous woman. In their work, Unceasing Kindness, uh, scholars Lau and Goswell, they point out several matching themes between the final chapter of Proverbs and the book of Ruth. We see declarations of worth, praiseworthy character, kindness, diligence, intelligence, and reward, just to name a few. Uh, they go even further to point out interesting parallels in grammar and structure and language. For example, at the very beginning of Proverbs 31, Lemuel's mother encourages him not to give away his strength to women who destroy kings. But in the conclusion of Ruth, we see this woman of worth provide a descendant who will lead to the gift of Israel's greatest king. There's no question. There are some striking similarities between the women of Proverbs 31 and Ruth. In fact, the similarities go beyond these women, even to their husbands, who were both well-respected at the city gate. And this brings us to our final chapter in our study on the book of Ruth. We'll be looking at chapter four and the meeting of our two guardian redeemers. Now, let's just go back and recap just a little bit to get us centered back in the story. In chapter three, Naomi sends Ruth to Boaz to save Ruth. Naomi knows that her daughter-in-law is barren, so she's not expecting an heir to redeem her family line. She also knows that if Boaz does take Ruth as his wife, that will leave Naomi to be completely on her own, and that's not likely to end well. But this is a sacrifice that Naomi is willing to make, a sacrifice to protect Ruth. But not to be outdone by her mother-in-law, Ruth doesn't just offer herself as marriage material, but she says, if you take me, you also take the land. And just so you know, I want redemption for Naomi. So Naomi pours out chesed on Ruth, Ruth pours out chesed on Naomi, and because of their dual acts of sacrifice for one another, Boaz pours out chesed of his own. He promises that he will see to it, that redemption will be realized. And oh, if that is not the gospel. Now we have waited to address this redeemer aspect of the book of Ruth until the end. However, the Hebrew root of the verb redeem is used of a person 21 times in this small narrative. That's pretty significant. But where else do we see this redemptive work at play in Ruth? Well, the basic definition of a redeemer, according to historian Edward Campbell, is someone who takes responsibility for the unfortunate and stands as their supporter and advocate. They are to embody the basic principle of caring responsibility for those who may not have had justice done for them. So with that definition in mind, the answer to the question of where is everywhere. <laughs> 
Redemption is what the book of Ruth is all about. So let's check in on these two redeemers mentioned in this final chapter. The text says this, starting in verse 1. Meanwhile, Boaz went to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. And then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except for you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, the man said. So Boaz leads with the proposition of land, and he leaves Ruth out of it at first, because whoever claims this property may be doubling their estate, and that's pretty appealing. Interestingly, though, Boaz brings up Naomi. He calls the land Naomi's land, and that was really pretty unheard of. Land would always be given to the sons, and a few exceptions were made for daughters if there were no sons. But if there were no children, land would immediately go to the closest male relative. Care wasn't really given to widows in land matters. Remember, this is part of Naomi's living death. So why aren't the elders raising an eyebrow here when Boaz claims that Naomi is the one selling this property? Well, this could be another reference to Boaz's reputation, to his clout, his influence in the community. It might also have something to do with his, his lineage. See, Boaz is a descendant of Nashon, and Nashon was one of Israel's greatest historical leaders. He was the commanding general of the largest division of the Israelite army. He was the first tribal leader to offer sacrifices at the dedication of the temple. And so if you are in the line of Nashon, you're kind of considered... Israel's first family, clearly a natural-born leader. So apparently, if Boaz wants to make an allowance for a widow, so be it. That said, I think that naming Naomi here may have also been a ploy on Boaz's part to throw this redeemer off kilter or maybe even push him to decline the offer. Because see, the land is enticing, but the widow, not so much. However, seeing as Naomi is without an heir or without the ability to provide an heir, this really is nothing but a lucrative offer. And so the Goel is all in until Boaz mentions Ruth. Verse 5. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you will also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with the property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. So here's the expectation. Being a guardian redeemer means you gain more land and more land means more profit, right? The unexpected reality is that being a guardian redeemer has a cost. Think about Elimelech's land. What happened to it all that time that they were away from Bethlehem? Well, we know that there was a famine going on. So while we don't know for sure, chances are that land has just been sitting there dormant all this time. That means that it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of resources to get that land back up and running. Now that's totally worth it if the land belongs to the Redeemer, but not so much if it has to be passed on to someone else. If this wife, this widow, Ruth, who's being redeemed, if she bears a son, that son does not fall in line with the Redeemer's other sons. No, this son will actually take the place of the previously deceased husband. And this means that any inheritance that grew for the Redeemer when this proposition happened upon marriage, it will now shrink when that son is born. And so a guardian redeemer would be responsible to use his own resources, finances, manpower to make that land profitable and to keep it that way. But in the end, he stands to lose it all, which means that this redeemer has not only lost some of his own resources, but he's also dwindled the inheritance for his own sons by putting those resources in the redeemed land instead of his own. 
So accepting the position of guardian redeemer when there is a fruitful widow involved, that is not a savvy business proposition. But it is full of opportunity for chesed. This is the second time that Ruth has looked at Boaz and essentially said, I see your law and I raise you love. And this is the second time that Boaz has met her unorthodox request without hesitation. Let's keep reading. Verse 7. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Now, I don't know about you, but this sandal transaction part has always been a bit puzzling to me. I understand we're talking about a different culture here, but haven't you ever wondered where this came from? Well, apparently the original audience for Ruth wondered that as well, so we have this explanation. But let's go to a text where we see this explained a little bit further. Deuteronomy 25. Now, in this chapter, this is actually where we see the Leverite law about marriage, marrying the widow. All of that is laid out, the purpose behind it. But when you get down a little further in verse 7, this is what it says. However, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at the town gate and say, My husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to me. Then the elders of his town shall summon him and talk to him. And if he persists in saying, I do not want to marry her, then that brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, take off one of his sandals, spit in his face, and say, this is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line. That man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. Ah, well then. I guess that clears things up. No. (laughs) But here's, here's what we do know. There are several places in the Old Testament where the symbolism of sandals comes into play with land. Psalm 60 is one example. God throws a sandal onto Edom, and it seems that he's claiming this land to be his own. We also know that both Moses and Joshua were commanded by God to remove their sandals when they were on holy ground, on God's land. There's even extra biblical resources from the second millennium that cite a a landowner lifting his foot off of his property and placing the foot of the new owner on the property. So this gesture here in Ruth chapter 4, I mean, it seems to follow suit in simply symbolizing a land transfer before the watching eyes of the elders of the town. Pretty straightforward, I suppose. Thankfully, we see something less puzzling and more beautiful in verse 9. So let's keep reading. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or among his town. Today you are witnesses. Now Boaz says so much right here that he did not have to say. First of all, it's Elimelech's land, period. But Boaz honors Ruth's husband as well. He also, he declares in front of everyone that he fully recognizes Ruth is a Moabite. But by accepting her and bringing her into his family, she is now an Israelite. So redemption of the land is not the only thing happening here. We are witnessing Gentile inclusion as well. And finally, Boaz makes sure that everyone understands, including Ruth, that he is absolutely doing this for one reason, to secure her family line. This is not for his benefit. Well, in verses 11 and 12, we see the reaction. The town rejoices and references are made to Leah and Rachel. Now, these women are matriarchs of Israel. They are the mothers of the 12 tribes. So because Boaz has given a blessing to Ruth, she now receives Bethlehem's tribal blessing as well. And by including Ruth with these women, they are calling her mother almost prophetically. 
Now, we also see a reference to Tamar in regard to Ruth. This would have been less common in blessings of marriage and family, but it's likely that they're drawing a connection between these two women, two women who were both widowed outsiders, but were made insiders. And then in verse 13, it says, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Now, I told you in the last session that I fully believe there's evidence that nothing unsavory happened between Ruth and Boaz on the threshing floor. And that evidence is here. Before, they were unmarried, and they honored that. But now they are married, and they honor that. And the Lord honors them both. But there is something interesting right here. Look at your Bibles. What does the heading to this section of scripture say? Mine says Naomi gains a son. But that must be a misprint, right? Because this child isn't Naomi's son, it's Ruth's son. But look at the text. Verse 14. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms, and she cared for him. And the women living there said, Naomi has a son. Naomi has a son. This is not just a rejoicing over an heir by way of a grandchild. This is the Leverite law fulfilled. Ruth gave herself as a surrogate, and that was always the plan. It was Elimelech's land and Elimelech's name, and it's Elimelech's widow that Boaz redeemed. Ruth just simply offered her womb as a way to make it all happen. A broken womb, but a willing one. Her final act of Hesed. But take heart. In a moment when it seems like Ruth has all but been forgotten, she is also praised. Notice what the women say to Naomi about her daughter-in-law, that Ruth is better than seven sons. Now, this is not just flowery language right here. This is significant. Take the book of Job, for example. Job loses what is considered the perfect family, seven sons and three daughters. And when he is restored, he is again given this ideal family of seven sons and three daughters. But these women here are saying that that may be ideal for some, but today only one daughter is needed, and that is Ruth. And in a patriarchal society where sons added to your strength and daughters were a burden, this is saying something. They see her covenant faithfulness. They see her sacrificial love, and they raise their proverbial glass. But Obed, the child, the son, he is placed in Naomi's arms, and he is raised by that woman, a woman who knew her God well and whose faith had been forged in the fire. And you know, I cannot help but think of Obed's grandson, who wrote many psalms, I feel like I see the realness of dark days in those psalms, but also the relentless love of God. That grandson, David, who also had the blood of a brave and intelligent and faithful woman flowing in his veins, Ruth. Ruth, who would have had the courage to believe that nothing is impossible for God, not even facing a giant. Well, back to Ruth, chapter 4. This all closes in verse 18 with a 10-person genealogy, which, by the way, corresponds quite poetically with how this book began, 10 years in a foreign land. The genealogy begins with Perez, whose mother Tamar was just mentioned in the blessing over Ruth and Boaz. And then you'll notice Boaz is not mentioned seventh, perhaps a shout out to Ruth, who is better than seven sons. And of course, it ends with the name David. And the book ending is complete. Ruth chapter 1 verse 2 says that Elimelech was an Ephrathite from Bethlehem in Judah. And 1 Samuel 17 12 says that David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Redemption. It is an undeniable theme here in Ruth and really throughout the entire story of God. All throughout the Old Testament, we see God put laws and people in place to redeem the foreigner, 
the fatherless, and the widow. The responsibility of these people, like Boaz, was to embody the Lord's redemptive care. So guardian redeemers, they would have redeemed land that had to be forfeited by family members. They would have redeemed possessions that had to be sold by family members. They would have redeemed family members who had to be sold into slavery. But ultimately, we who live on the other side of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we know that redemption is so much more than physical well-being. But redemption in its highest form is the salvation of our souls. See, redemption is Ruth's story, yes, but it's also our story. We struggled to survive in our brokenness. But we were told that there is a promise. A promise of the greatest act of chesed that has ever been enacted in human history. One is coming who will change everything. One who will exchange our darkness for light and our mourning for dancing. One who will take our brokenness and give us new life. I tell my students all the time, no matter what text you are preaching or what passage you are teaching, always, always take your people to the cross. And this is not a stretch. This is not a mishandling of scripture because every book bears his blood, every story his sacrifice, and the book of Ruth is no exception. You know, it's funny. I actually stand here corrected. It seems that the story of Ruth is a love story after all, a foreshadowing of the greatest love story ever told. So as we close our time together, can I just give you one word of encouragement? Keep reading, friends. Because while this story may be expected, it will never grow old. <laughs>